I can see now that we have our chair with us. <laughs> uh, and uh, I would like to introduce to you um, Professor Paul Arthur, um, who is a our keynote speaker for today. Uh, and he's a chair in digital humanities and social sciences and director of the Edith Cohen Center for Global Issues in, in the School of Art uh, and Humanities. Uh, and he will uh, chair this uh, session for today. Uh, and um, the floor is yours, Paul. Um, and I will assist you with some uh, things related to questions from the other directories. So just in case we have some uh, questions for the um, participants, uh, I will just uh, let you know and ask the question. So the other, the other question will be taped here on the chat or asked orally. So uh, the floor is yours and we can start, I think, uh, the session number one of the conference. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm pleased to be able to chair this session and look forward to the presentations to come. Um, I'd like to remind the attendees to keep microphones muted during the session, if that's possible, uh, so that we don't have any extra noise. And also that this session is recorded. Uh, and if there's any issues with that, you could return, you can turn off the video, uh, but this is recorded uh, because it's an important event and, and that's what you know, is, is arranged. And for speakers, I'd like to remind everybody about the timing. Please keep the speakers to the framework of the, the time frame that has been agreed. 15 minutes for talking and uh, five minutes for questions and answers. Um, so let's, let's begin. Um, so we have uh, the section one, cultural heritage in the digital dimension. And I'd like to invite our first speakers to speak on the topic of the virtual museum, models of legal regulation in the BRICS countries. And, and this is actually a very, very important topic. Uh, I'm aware of it in a global context, um, how, how significant this work is. So I'm very grateful um, to learn about this and I welcome you as speakers. Can I start? Hello. We can hear you very well and the uh, presentation is on the screen. Mm -hmm. Good day, dear colleagues. Uh, let me present you a report on the topic Virtual Museum Models of Legal Regulation in the BRICS Countries. Um, the use of multimedia elements by museums is not a new theme. Uh, back in 1996, within the framework of the International Committee for Documentation, this question was discussed. The pandemic has dealt a significant impact to the activities of cultural institutions and served as a catalyst for the digital transformation of museums. Uh, virtual museums uh, is used for increasing the number of visitors, for the thematic collaborations, for the possibility of using digitized models to restore the lost ones, for maintaining the cultural flow during a pandemic and for entering access to cultural heritage regardless of location and etc. The goal of this research is to identify models of legal regulation of relations associated with the creation of virtual museums and the use of the content which are implemented in the BRICS countries. That's why these questions uh, had appeared and uh, the main questions um, uh, is who has the right to create a virtual museum? Uh, what is the place of digitization result in the system of intellectual property right? What is the scope and type of museum's rights in relation to the uh, digitized items? And what is the place of virtual museums uh, in uh, the system of objects of intellectual property rights? In uh, European Union, several questions are resolved uh, in the directive, but Russia are not in European Union and this act doesn't apply to Russia. Uh, the BRICS countries don't have such kind of international acts uh, now. Uh, 
Um, with the widespread interethnic nature and significance of new public relations for the creation of virtual museums, the normative regulation is characterized by fragmentation and the absence of uh, uniform international norms. Uh, as I've said, uh, the one of the main question, who has uh, a right to digitize the museum items and what is the scope of museum's right on it? Uh, in law enforcement practice, there was the following case. Uh, the artist uh, Pedro America created the painting, um, as you see on the slide, uh, and the artist uh, died uh, um, and the painting was placed in Brazil's National Museum uh, of Fine Arts. In the late, uh, a major cheese producer began using uh, the Pedro America painting, uh, placing it on the packaging of the cheese. Uh, the museum uh, didn't allow the usage of uh, this uh, item, and we can see that the painting has passed into the public domain. Uh, it, uh, uh, this situation uh, was the uh, um, reason for discussing the legitimacy of using a painting without the permission of a museum. And legal scholars uh, conclude that there is no rule uh, in Brazil law for, um, that requires uh, the consent of uh, museum to use paintings uh, that uh, have passed uh, into the public domain. In Russian law enforcement pra practice, there was a similar case, uh, the painting Lady in Blue by uh, Thomas uh, Gainsborough under the right uh, of uh, operation uh, management uh, by State Hermitage Museum. Uh, and uh, this item uh, was uh, uh, and now uh, belongs uh, to the uh, State Hermitage Museum, uh, the designer uh, decided to use uh, the um, painting um, Lady in Blue as commercial uh, designation and background for the um, fashion show. Uh, the Hermitage appeal appealed uh, to the court with a demand to oblige the designer to stop using the painting with reference uh, to the federal law on the museum fund uh, and the fundamentals of legislation of Russian Federation on Culture. The court granted uh, the museum's uh, claim um, because uh, the transition uh, to the public domain doesn't matter uh, in Russian Federation uh, and the right uh, to prohibit uh, is an independent right um, and belongs to the museum by virtue of the law. Um, the results uh, of research are shown in the table. Uh, we can see common and uh, difference uh, in the way of regulation, the creation of virtual museum. Uh, we can see that uh, the last line about qualifications uh, um, are unified. Uh, the BRICS countries have a unified approach uh, and understand that uh, the virtual museums uh, are copyright object. Uh, it, uh, they are element of um, um, system of intellectual property rights. Uh, that's why, um, uh, according um, to the ratio of public and private interest and in regulation relations uh, uh, to the created and use of virtual museums content, um, the, um, the, um, classif uh, cl the classification of uh, um, BRICS uh, legal orders are on the slide, um, and uh, BRICS legal orders uh, uh, can classify into such types as balanced model, uh, pro museum model, and uh, pro offer model. Uh, as you see, Russia is uh, belonging to the pro museum model. And this model is characterized by establishing a special set of rights from museums uh, that allow and prohibit the use of um, images of items from uh, the museum collection by others and the dominance of a special legal regime established by law 
on the museum fund and uh, the fundamentals of legislation on culture other exclusive copyrights. Mm, it seems uh, that the type of model is influenced by the legal tradition and the level of uh, digitalization process in the country and the organization of the considered legal models of regulation will contribute to the expansion of the international cultural flow in the virtual environment. Um, that is all I would like to say. Uh, I'm ready to answer uh, your question, if any. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, as I understand it, in, in the order of proceedings, we will have each presentation and then some time for questions at the end. Or, or is that the case? I, I, I think this is the way yeah, that that's it is. Okay, okay. Yeah. okay thank you. Uh, and, but thank you very much. I'm, I'm grateful for, for your presentation. And so the next presentation uh, will be on ideal oh, future. Oh, excuse me. Uh, I that uh, every speaker has questions uh, right after the presentation. Oh, okay. That would be easier, okay. I think. Okay. Sorry. Well, well, that's no, that's a good idea. I thought that would be better. Um, so let's have questions that can be directed towards this uh, presentation now either in the chat or others who might want to speak uh, and present their questions. Uh, can I ask a question? Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. It's uh, absolutely the topic I love so much. Uh, but um, I have a very particular one. What do you mean under uh, the virtual museum? Uh, because um, it's a bit difficult to, to um, give a, a certain uh, a legal definition of what is a virtual museum. Uh, because uh, ICOM has not uh, some strict definition for a museum itself. Does it influence some way on your research? And the, the, second, the second question is, um, do you think that a virtual museum as a sort of uh, information resource uh, can be produced only a uh, museum uh, as a cultural institution or maybe uh, academia or some other institution can produce this sort of thing as well? Uh, thank you for your question. Um... Of course, uh, there is no legislative uh, definition of virtual museum, uh, but in the literature, for example, Maria Pianchete uh, proposed a free typology of ways for museums presence in the internet, and uh, she, uh, she, she said uh, that sites uh, in the form of electronic branches, virtual and interactive museum uh, is uh, the way uh, for the museum um, for the, for the digitalization um, museums um, from traditional form uh, to the virtual form. Um, that's why um, maybe um, uh, we haven't uh, um, uh, we, Mm, we have no uh, legal uh, instrumentation for the definition of uh, these categories and uh, uh, maybe it is uh, not necessity for the legal practice. Um, I um, only um, one question uh, I understand. Uh, maybe you can repeat the second question for me. Does a cultural institution produce a virtual museum, uh, or it's something unique for museums only? Um, I'm so sorry, <laughs> but I don't understand uh, your second question. That's okay. You can discuss it in person uh, after the, the session. No worries. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions at this stage? I can see some very positive comments in the chat, uh, which is, you know, very, very good. Um, would anyone like to propose a particular question? Actually, I can see a question here 
Um, I, I'm trying to understand the, you know, the main gist of the question in the chat. Um, Christina, would you like to propose your question uh, directly? Um, if you're hearing this. Uh, yes, so uh, good afternoon, uh, dear speakers. Good afternoon, dear moderator. So I would like to um, emphasize the meaning that I imply by my question. Uh, as I can see that uh, pr the pro-author model uh, limits uh, the museum with uh, some dissemination and promotion of art among ordinary people, uh, among uh, those people who are not um, aware of theory of culture, for example, and uh, people who are not experts in uh, culture and art. And uh, does this model uh, really limit uh, such people with uh, um, uh, with uh, uh, trying to understand the art. So I mean that uh, if a company or, for example, um, if a company can't use uh, the images of art in their um, in their, for example, promotional material. So uh, doesn't it uh, limit us as customers? Uh, with um, um, getting familiar with uh, some of art objects, for example. So, mm -hmm. thank you for your question. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the balance model is uh, favorable uh, for the um, population, uh, for the museum, and for the ordinary people. But pro offer model uh, is. Uh, uh, the approach for limited uh, the museum and ordinary people uh, to um, access the digitized uh, items. Um, I think so. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think we need, to, uh, thank you very much for everyone's questions. I think we want to move on to the next uh, paper and presentation because we've got a number in this session. Um, so let's let's finish off that and, and very much um, thank the current presenter. Um, and now we can move, I think, to the next presentation on the topic of ideal future in World War II media discourse, corpus-based research of British, American and French digitalized historical newspapers. And I welcome the presenters. I'm oh, sorry, something something happened with my camera. Can you hear me? We can see you and hear you. Yeah, that's good. Okay, Welcome. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, can you see my screen? Oh, yes, you've just shared it successfully. Thank you. That's great. Okay. Okay, please go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Uh, dear colleagues, we are glad to present you a part of our project. Uh, we work with media discourse of the World War II period. We define media uh, discourse about war as a mode of organizing knowledge, ideas, and experience of war that are rooted in the media and influenced by historical, geopolitical, social, and cultural contexts. Our, our recent papers deal with the relevant issue of using digital libraries for research and education. It is necessary for universities to adopt the nature and scope of online digital technologies, digital libraries, 
in order to expand their options and services to a new research and educational paradigm. There are several reasons for it. Academic libraries seek to apply maximum of the research and educational <clears throat> uh, potential of digital libraries by providing open access not only to traditional resources, uh, such as books, journals, articles, but also to data sets related to particular projects. Modern online technologies in educational process allow for creating better and more extended educational programs. Sharing scientific data increases the effectiveness of education, data and knowledge processing. Research and scientific projects generate enormous amounts of data and findings accessible at any place by any researcher student via the internet. Metadata can be updated over time. Using online digital collections creates the conditions for involving uh, wider groups um, in research and educational processes, students, postgraduates, librarians, etc. Besides uh, using digital resources and research findings in the educational process increases the value of scientific knowledge across society. The research data were drawn from three sources containing highly representative texts, uh, the British Newspaper Archive, a commercial database of the British Library, containing most of the runs of historic newspapers published in the UK, Chronicle America, an open access collection created by the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Library of Congress, and Gallica, the online library of National Library of France. The collections listed in the digital libraries contain primary sources, digital images of actual documents, newly designed user interfaces, full text searching and cross collection indexing help to process the free large corpora, simplified uh, our empirical investigation leading to research findings that have greater validity. The objective was to show the way the media generated and framed preferable futures of the post-war world and the USSR in media discourses of Great Britain, the USA, and France, and to draw attention to the function the image of the ideal future performs in this type of discourse. Why do we study the future in this particular type of discourse? Because media discourse about war tends to present the image of the future as a black and white value model. It means that the future splits into two futures, the best case scenario and the worst case scenario, victory and defeat, life and death. When working with the corpora, the publication date was limited to the period from uh, 1st of September, 1939 to 2nd September, 2nd of September, 1945. The search times included future, post-war, USSR. Searching all the words within the text with articles and illustrated articles among article type with the results sorted by relevance. We fix various means that can express the idea of the future in media political forecasting and their frequency, classified and exemplified them, worked out their typology. The uh, concept of the future can be expressed grammatically through modality, future tense forms and present tense forms with future time references. Uh, lexically, with the help uh, of explicit lexical tense markers, conceptually, using cognitive metaphors that structure the forecast, blend conceptual inputs, grammatical and lexical means, drive the text into the future and yield extra communicative and cognitive effects of evaluation. So we began with quantitative findings and then worked toward qualitative ones using a number of methods. With the help of combinational analysis, we describe the role uh, the semantic component, uh, components play in the meaning of the word, the place uh, they occupy in structure and their interrelations. Uh, contextual analysis helped to reveal the individual meaning of the polysemic word, considering its lexical environment and syntactic context. Uh, conceptual metaphor analysis implies studying the interaction of two cognitive structures, the source domain and the target domain, finding out universal uh, or basic metaphors that produce an, uh, an ideal projection of the post-war world and the future of the USSR. The method of discourse anal uh, analysis helped to assess uh, the text in their historical, uh, cultural or social context. 
in the end, we made comparison between the three corpora and three discourses. Uh, that's a short description of the way we interpreted our samples. Uh, the British corpus yields numerous examples portraying the future of the post-war world as home. The concept of home is a constitu uh, constitu uh, constitutive metaphor in a political sphere. As a political value in describing the future, home is a useful concept because it promotes a sense of security, connection, common purpose, and well-being for the whole post-war world. Uh, home refers to identity as well, identity that is shared with some people and denied to others. As home is a space of identity uh, and security, we reject those who do not belong here or were not invited. Uh, the future is home metaphor in media discourse of World War II models the ideal future as a safe, secure, commonplace for all the United Nations who fought against Nazism. The use of the possessive pronoun our uh, accentuates the meanings of identity and togetherness. That's our future and our home. Every house has a door. In fact, the future as home has door as well. The metaphor doors used in the plural number shows that the future is multiversion. It has many variants to unfold. The ideal future has many names, victory, liberty, and peace, but these doors are locked. There are barriers by which an entrance uh, into the future is closed. Uh, the key to these doors is Russia. The key has the meanings of uh, an instrument specially cut to fit into a lock and move its bolt, a device that has the function of the key, something that provides a solution. The noun key is used with a definite article in its uh, specifying function and a post-modifying restrictive attribute, uh, attributive clause, the key that can uh, unlock the doors of our future. This serves to single out Russia as a unique country, uh, the very key to unlock the doors of the future. The model verb can, uh, can unlock shows uh, that Russia has the abilities, resources, and strength to do it. Uh, that was an example of our qualitative uh, analysis. In general, we came to the conclusion that the image of the ideal future uh, is uh, thought to be one of the fundamental values of media discourse about war and a discourse based mental from the sh uh, shapes and changes uh, social knowledge, beliefs, and opinions, exercising uh, a fundamental global control function in discourse production and comprehension. The application of our findings and material to the scientific and educational processes include organizing several exhibitions held, uh, held at South Ural State University and at Chilean State Museum of Local History. Our exhibition proved to be a modern interdisciplinary educational project, it was aimed at realizing a, uh, a large set of general and professional competences. It offered a new way of understanding the war. It let our students and visitors find out real wartime stories and see the war through a new context. Archive photos and texts uh, published in Soviet, British, French, Spanish, and Italian newspapers and magazines. Uh, the research team is now uh, working on uh, compiling the digitized archive. Uh, it's an online collection of unique archival documents containing information about the Ural region in wartime. Um, our digitized archive has already received information, uh, informational support from national, federal, and regional resources, including the government, the Ministry of Defense, and others. So all this all, thank you for listening. Thank you very much for your presentation, which was fascinating. Um, now I'd like to call for any questions uh, that we can have to follow up at this stage. Uh, are there some questions in the chat or should, uh, it would be better to have them live if you're able to speak. I'd like to ask the question, uh, is it possible? So the, yes. uh, the talk was very interesting, thank you so much. Uh, and the question, um, 
do you face uh, in your work uh, with a uh, legal issue? Uh, we know that uh, Russia is not the easiest country to live in, uh, and uh, being a historian means to cope with all these uh, specifics of uh, Russian policy. Uh, so uh, do you uh, tend to avoid uh, these dangerous topics uh, in the uh, public representation? I mean, your virtual exhibition, uh, or you just um, think that it's okay, the, the topics should be very diverse? How do you cope with that? Thank you for the question. Um, uh, you mean if uh, there were any uh, obstacles to, uh, we find when we present our project, right? Uh, there are some things when, for, for instance, um, the cases of uh, when Russian soldiers uh, invaded um, European part, uh, and they uh, were assigned to be um, like criminals, they could steal something, the sort of things. Uh, and it's absolutely uh, out of the public spaces and virtual as well. Uh, so, uh, and more often it's represented, the virtual exhibitions represent uh, sort of uh, honor uh, and uh, brave situation for Russian soldiers, but not this, you know, uh, the things that had, has happened, but uh, I doubt uh, how to represent it in, in the public space. What do you think about it? Mm. We presented uh, our project um, uh, in France uh, last year. And uh, I need to say that uh, uh, there were not uh, any uh, uh, I don't know how to say geopolitic um, so we uh, presented uh, a few times our project uh, abroad and uh, <laughs> there were so um, many questions uh, about um, uh, uh, yeah, politics. You 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 mean that, right? Yeah, as well. Yeah. Um, I guess geopolitics uh, does uh, uh, resemble our real life in a way. When we are friends, we do like our friends, we forgive, uh, forgive them uh, their mistakes and uh, overlook their faults. Um, so unlike real life, geopolitics knows no uh, permanent friends, only common interests. It knows no personal sympathies. Uh, but the possibility to face the future without fear and war <laughs> together, if you mean that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Are there any other questions um, for this presentation? I can't see any there in the chat. Can I ask? Of course. Uh, thank you so much, Maria, for the presentation and interesting uh, research. I have a question about the sources uh, of the research and uh, your archive. Can you um, tell us more and maybe give a link of this project? And uh, also one question, uh, how uh, you think your uh, research is uh, historical or linguistic or maybe interdisciplinary? How do you um, uh, think about it? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, I guess it's uh, a completely interdisciplinary project. Uh, 
it, uh, the project uh, uh, um, has a uh, historical, cultural, and social contexts, and uh, um, of course, um, ling linguistic one um, and. Um, uh, it depends on the material we uh, uh, we research and uh, uh, our archive. I don't know how to. <laughs> maybe I can uh, leave the link to this. I have uh, in in chat, mm -hmm. um, and um, if you give a look on the screen, um, you can see uh, uh, it's about uh, archival documents, and. Um, we have uh, five languages, uh, five discourses, uh, France, uh, Great Britain, Spain, uh, Italy, and USSR. So uh, there are uh, many <laughs> uh, options uh, to observe, uh, texts, uh, Photos. Um, it's um, um, it's uh, the point uh, now. Uh, our team uh, is working on compiling the archive. So uh, I guess um, um, there will be not only archival documents, may, uh, but. Uh, um, Some, you know, so. so I guess I will leave the link to this icon. And uh, if uh, you are interested in, you can follow the link and uh, maybe uh, leave uh, uh, some opinions about what what you think, and uh, maybe you can suggest something yes uh, i i guess because uh, and it is really interesting for us in kaliningrad because we have an archive of soviet press kaliningrad and now we are thinking how to do it more better and uh, i think we can collaborate and discuss of uh, our researching of this uh, type and maybe some uh, do uh, of this. So maybe after the our sessions, we can uh, send us. Uh, yeah, it great. Thank, thank you so much for your interest. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you. I think that's been a very helpful discussion. And I'd like to thank Maria uh, Kagan and oh. Olga Filipova for your presentation. Um, and now move on uh, to the next presentation of uh, electronic environment for the functioning of the regional socio-cultural brands of the Volga Grad region. Um, and uh, where are our presenters? I'm looking on the screen now. Ekaterina um, Belakova and Olga, oh, hang on, Anna Nestrova. I, I'm not sure which is the, who is the presenting um, author of this presentation. Is it Ekaterina? Um, and also Olga Sknefeva. Uh, excuse me, uh, probably it should be this third presentation by Angelina Sayanko, the previous one. Oh, I've got them in the wrong order. Okay. Yes, I see that I've got something um, in the wrong order on my list here. I'm um, sorry. No, no, that's okay. Um, so third presentation. Um, Okay, yes, the architectural 
heritage of Königsberg Kalingrad in the regional in West Troika. Okay, let's move straight to this presentation from Angelina. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, dear organizers and colleagues. I um, <coughs> want to represent uh, the same, the architectural heritage of uh, Königsberg and Kaliningrad uh, in the regional press during Perestroika. The Kaliningrad region of Russia uh, possesses a unique historical heritage. As such, there is a polyphony of cultural traditions represented in the Kaliningrad region by immigrants from different regions of the former Soviet Union. To some extent, in a continuation of uh, centuries old vector of development uh, in a um, multi ethnic and multi confessional East Russia community. In this regard, it is a particularly crucial to understand the mechanism of foreign attitudes to historical and cultural heritage in this region. This process has undergone significant changes. Uh, after the end of the Second World War, a decision at the Potsdam Conference uh, ceded the northern part of East Russia along with Königsberg to the USSR. The first immigrants to the Kaliningrad region went there to uh, build a new Soviet region. Uh, the authorities uh, proclaimed a policy of expulsion uh, of the Prussian spirit and de facto prohibiting to study uh, pre-Soviet history. To make any alien cultural heritage objects their own, the Russian people needed to appreciate them, to adapt them and get used to an unfamiliar cultural landscape. The situation began to change, to change in the second half of the 80s with the beginning of Perestroika. Uh, and, uh, on the slide, we can see um, an example of uh, the page of Königsbergsky Kurier and uh, every uh, name of the uh, publications uh, is different from the other period. Uh, the study of the attitude to the historical and cultural heritage of Kaliningrad uh, began only in 2000s. Expulsion of the Prussian Spirit by Yuri Kostyashov was the first book on the topic. After analyzing uh, the form formational specifics of the historical consciousness of Kaliningrad residents in the first decade after the end of the Second World War. To date, the leading place in research on this topic belongs to concept of sites of memory, developed by Pierre Nara and supported by many authors in Russia and abroad, abroad for example, Poland and uh, Lithuania. Uh, the sources for the study were materials from the four most popular regional newspapers of the Perestroika period, which has different target audience. First of all, this is the main newspaper of the region, the organ of the regional com committee of the Communist Party, Kaliningradska Pravda. In the second, uh, the Yars Press, the regional newspaper Kaliningradski Komsomolets, which renamed uh, in Prost Effect Mira, and the department weekly newspaper about students and for students in Kaliningrad University. Thirdly, a weekly that a period during the publishing growth in 1991, uh, uh, Kurier funded by the International Fund. In total, there were uh, 1,000 uh, to, uh, to hundreds and thirty articles on historical and cultural heritage published during the, this period. Of them, uh, 193 
contained information uh, about architecture, architectural objects. And this chart uh, shows this chart shows uh, the number of uh, press publications uh, depending on the date. Uh, how we can see until 1987, newspapers and tensions did not, not focus on these topics. And after the uh, policy of glassness, uh, um, there was uh, a growth of uh, the interest for this team. Uh, to achieve the goal of uh, uh, survey, the article uh, employed method was content analysis with the program MaxQDA. Uh, and there we can see a category system, and the main category was object of architectural heritage. It includes uh, three subcategories. Um, public and residential buildings, fortification, and uh, religious buildings. And we then tell about it. Uh, blue color on the chart shows category public and resi uh, residential buildings. It occupies 49% of all publications. These constructions include building of cultural institutions, administration, education, hospitals, museums, and etc. The first frequently mentioned object is the Königsberg Castle. Uh, the origin purpose of the castle is a fortress founded by the Knights of the Teutonic Order in the 13th century. Uh, it was soon changed. Uh, the castle history, we can see it on the left, uh, uh, remained taboo topics for a long time. A reference to it in the press first appeared as a reference of pre-Soviet postcards and photographs. In 1990s, uh, the newspaper Kaliningradsky Komsomolist published some materials about um, explosion of Königsberg Castle ruins in several issues. It is interesting because it named uh, this series of articles Battle After the Victory. All an, an allusion uh, is evident. Battle as a metaphor for the castle's explosions and the time after victory, meaning after the hostilities of the Second World War, which has ended long ago. And uh, touching upon this topic of the castle, it is impossible not mention the House of Soviets. It's uh, in the slide on the right, uh, built on the site of uh, the Blown Rock uh, ruins. Ringrad's main long-term Soviet construction sites appears on the page of newspapers three, three times less than the castle. However, while the press, the Königsberg castle in idealized form, they showed the house of Soviet uh, with irony and even uh, sarcasm. The second most frequently mentioned category is religious buildings. Uh, it mentions on the chart in red color. Uh, one uh, should note the fact that uh, by the middle of 80s, all religious buildings on the territory of the Kaliningrad regions were pre-Soviet pre -Soviet buildings. Most often, they were monuments of Gothic architecture. The familiar to central Russia cross-domed churches were absent here. Uh, and some of the former German churches were used as warehouse and gyms. Others were demolished during new constructions of 60s and 70s. And uh, this attitude to church monuments were characteristic for the entire Soviet Union. Uh, the most frequently uh, topic of this is cathedral. The cathedral is the most mentioned urban architecture object in the period press. In newspaper articles, the term temple increasingly replaces its name, despite religious services not having been held uh, there since the war. 
With the beginning of Perestroika, press publication began to discuss uh, the fate of the cathedral. The content of published materials reflected this uh, discussion. The third uh, category fortifications occupied a fifth of all materials um, of the architecture. The fortress city of Königsberg too has two rings of fortifications, walls, towers, gates, and swords. During the storming of the city in uh, after the war, the Red Army severely destroyed the uh, outer belt of the forts. However, the buildings of the 19th century, which were a part of the city, survived and started being used as a cultural objects, such as museum and exhibition halls. And one of the most controversial topics is the ratio of Soviet and pre-Soviet cultural heritage uh, publication in the press. Uh, this diagram shows that uh, 73 of all published images uh, depicted buildings uh, built uh, before 1945. The newspapers reproduce German postcards with views of the city of photographs of the Second World War destructions. And one more uh, category is uh, very interesting, and it is named background uh, semantic unit. And I wish to, to show one uh, example. Uh, we can um, see that uh, in uh, December of 90s, Kalingradska Pravda published um, uh, uh, a photo placed on the front page. Uh, on the one hand, it represents a typical urban scene with a crowd of people during a traditional New Year rush. Any other corner of Kaliningrad could be, have appeared uh, here as a background. But the editors choose uh, the puppet theater uh, and uh, former uh, Queen Louis Church. And they even highlighted the church in blue, uh, while the photographic uh, reports were black and uh, white. And uh, uh, analyzing of this background can show us um, the attitude for the uh, architectural objects. The analysis of publication in Kaliningrad Press regarding the historical and cultural heritage allows forming the following conclusions. One, with an increasing uh, openness of the press, the focus well on the architectural heritage of the pre-Soviet uh, period. While Soviet architecture accounted 27% uh, uh, of all publications. This, in the second, uh, illustrative materials, among which uh, modern views of ruins and partly destroyed buildings, predominated, accompanying most articles on architectural topics. This choice intended to stimulate readers' desire to preserve and restore uh, cult cultural heritage. And the thought focusing on pre-Soviet architectural heritage allowed raising the question of appreciation by Kaliningrad resident of previously aligned objects. At the same time, with the rejection of the Soviet experience inherent to the general discourse of perestroika, there was an effect acceptance of old Kenigs Kaliningrad, Königsberg, uh, both different and new, and new, but our own. Thank you for your attention. I will try to answer the questions. Thank you very much for your presentation, which was fascinating. Um, now, who would? Oh, I can see a couple of questions in the chat. Um, who, who would else? Who else would like to ask a question at this stage? Actually, these are mainly comments in the chat that I'm seeing now. Although, um, no, 
No, they're mainly comments. Um, so, please, any questions for this presentation? May I ask a question? Of course. Oh, thank you. So, thank you very much, Angelina, for your presentation. It was so interesting. And I do have a question about the difference between the representation of the architecture in modern press, I mean, today's press, and uh, the press of perestroika. Is there any difference of that? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your question. I don't uh, do the uh, survey about modern press, but I can uh, say about my uh, opinion, maybe. And we uh, now it is thinking, thinking then in the period of perestroika, it was uh, increasing of this uh, of interesting for this time, and uh, the publication was very uh, not maybe um, very Germanizing maybe, uh, and uh, there was a lot of publication about German period, um, but if we uh, thought uh, and, and um, can um, view these uh, publications, we see that um, one third uh, of 30% of the all publications is about Soviet, uh, Soviet history and Soviet uh, heritage. And uh, it is very interesting. Uh, because it in this period, period of perestroika, it was a tradition which um, it made a tradition to how um, today uh, we uh, understand uh, this, uh, the history of our region and historical objects. So, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? I'm looking for hands that might go up or other people who might want to comment. Um, but otherwise, we probably should go on to our next presentation um, to allow for any time at the end that we might have. Um, so, okay, I'm looking at the program that I have, which I hope is in the right order and the next presentation will be on the topic of electronic environment for the functioning of the regional socio-cultural brands for the Volgograd region, if I'm, if I'm correct. Um, and so I'd like to invite the presenters to uh, present this paper to us. Thank you. Do we have um, Ekaterina here who are ready to present this paper or somebody nominated for this talk? Hmm, I can't see, can't see her there. I don't think we have those who give a talks here. I can't no, relate okay. those who are in the in the room with the No, I can't things. see. I'm looking at the names. Um okay, so maybe there's a problem with the um issue of connection and maybe we should oh hang on, no, Sally. Um maybe we should change the order and move on, do you think, to the next presentation? Um if that makes sense, we could always return if those speakers and presenters were able to join us. Um, and so, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this presentation, the next one um, on the topic of digital approaches for studying elected representative institutions in late Imperial Russia. Um, if, Ileana, if, if you're here um, to present this. Oh, okay, good. Um, 
Thank you very much. Let's proceed with this talk. And I welcome the speakers. Thank you. Anna, we cannot hear your microphone. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, but now <laughs> you, you hear me? <laughs> oh. um, I'll try <laughs> once more. Um. And I, oh, well, that's um. me. <laughs> And what about now? <laughs> you can hear me. That sounds good. Um, in in this um, list of presenting authors, I recognize a couple of names of um, people I've met um, in Russia. I've had the privilege to uh, visit this part of the world and and I admire the research of, of these, these good people who we're hearing from. Um, and I, I'm, I'm looking forward to this paper. So please go ahead. Thank you. Um, dear colleges, uh, 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 I'd like to tell you about the results of our research. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, we will try to classify the existing digital approaches uh, for study uh, the history of local governments uh, and the parliamentary history uh, in the late imperial Russia. Uh, we analyzed digital projects uh, of the history of Russian and for, uh, forage um, uh, elected representative institutions. Uh, and uh, in the Russian Empire, the elected uh, bodies uh, uh, of the state system were formed uh, as the Zemstvo institutions, uh, the State Duma and the State Council. Uh, these were prototypes of parliamentary legislative bodies. Uh, and, of course, it was a key moment uh, in the history of uh, late Imperial Russia, uh, and uh, it was the time of political and social cultural transformations. Um, uh, also, we uh, tried to study uh, the modernization potential of Zemstvo in the late Imperial Russia and its place uh, in the system of the state governments. Um, I want to start with uh, documentary heritage of uh, elected representative institutions. Uh, and uh, on the slide, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, please, uh, can I, one more second? Uh, I can't uh, show you. Uh, <laughs> I'm very sorry. <laughs> uh, and uh, now uh, I can uh, show you some projects. Uh... Paul, may I uh, suggest a thing? Uh, can we give it another chance for uh, the current presentation to start no. with the very beginning? Absolutely. If, if we have the time, I think that would be very sensible. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. It's been a bit interrupted, so that would be great. Do we have our presenter here? No. Just okay. uh, oh, yes. Dear okay. colleagues, I'm sorry. We have problems. Uh, 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 we were just saying how good it would be if you could restart your presentation so that we could appreciate it in, in full if we're all if everything's good now and we're all connected. Um, Anna can join us in some reason. Oh. I think we can give a couple of minutes to try to join again. Uh, Ileana, uh, у тебя есть презентация со мной? 
Ну, да. А вот она, вот. Oh. I'm sorry. Uh, can I try once more? I know we're, we were just saying that it would be good to start from the beginning so that we could uh, now that we're all back together um, to begin the presentation again it would be good. Um, okay, so I think we can restart now. Um, if this is a stable connection that seems to be. Um, so let's begin again, if you'd like to share your screen. Uh, I can't share my screen uh, because the organizer... Uh... I'm sorry, one minute. Um, that looks good. Uh, yes, <laughs> sorry. Um, I think that we <laughs> let's start with uh, this slide. Uh, uh, there are uh, the examples of the projects uh, of digital projects uh, uh, when uh, in, in teach uh, the researchers uh, the solved the problems of preservation uh, and using uh, the heritage uh, of um, the Palangi bodies. Uh, and um, uh, in all these projects, uh, 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 sorry, uh, research, researchers of all these projects uh, provide open access to the historical sources and uh, solve the problems of um, preservation, um, document, documentary heritage. Uh, projects uh, aimed to digitize uh, and analyze parliamentary protocols and reports. Uh, and uh, what about Russian history? Uh, you can see on the slide uh, several projects uh, in which uh, the similar tasks uh, are solved. Uh, some of these projects uh, were carried out by uh, our project team uh, and our colleges from the Perm State University, uh, Igor Kiryanov, Nadezhda Pogroznik, Alina Ikhlakova and Daniel Rinov. Uh, and uh, a series uh, of PERM projects uh, provide complete preservation, organization, uh, and visualization uh, historical uh, information. Uh, we have prepared uh, collections of the digital sources on Zemstva and parliamentary history, uh, which became uh, the basis of our current research. Uh, and uh, what about uh, our last project, uh, we uh, implemented uh, the Hyder School uh, of Economics uh, uh, and uh, this project uh, solved the problems of uh, studying Zemstvo institutions and parliamentary bodies as a unified system uh, of public administration in the late Imperial Russia. Uh, and an important part of this project was to study uh, the professional trajectory uh, of Zemstvo deputies and their experience of uh, working in Zemstvo institutions uh, before being elected to the State Duma. Uh, on the slide, uh, you can see uh, the main groups of methods uh, used uh, in the project. And uh, let's uh, talk, talk uh, about them uh, in more detail. Uh, the statistical methods uh, makes it possible to get a statistical portrait uh, of a such group of deputies, uh, which uh, came uh, from the Institute of Parliament. Uh, their uh, so social cultural characteristics and uh, sets of parliamentary activities. Uh, also, we compared the activity of this group of deputies in the Parliament, uh, these other members of the State Duma. Uh, and the results of the study show that uh, activity of Zemstvo officials uh, in Parliament was higher, uh, especially in the first and, and second convocations. Uh, the indicators uh, of activity of this group of deputies are presented on the slide. 
uh, and uh, we can tell about uh, the special lift uh, from the Zemstvo to the parliament. Uh, it's turn, turn, uh, turned out to be common practice, and this part was taken by 25% uh, uh, of parliament members. Um, also, we tried uh, to develop uh, a methodology for analyzing the share of modernity and traditionalism in the discussions of the Ziemstra deputies. Uh, and uh, our methodics is based on the content analysis uh, of the journals of Ziemstra assemblies. Uh, we identified uh, markers uh, that are associated with traditionalism and modernity uh, and considered forms and collocations for the analysis of this topic. Uh, the slide uh, show the results of using of this methodology at the Perm Provincial Zemstvo. Uh, and then in Antkong, uh, the resulting terms uh, are checked uh, for the content by using uh, tools like uh, the concordance and collocations. Uh, in addition, we researched uh, the new newspaper uh, of Perm Promotional Zemstvo. Uh, it is uh, Perm Zemstvo Week. Uh, you also uh, can see it uh, in the slide. Uh, and uh, we analyzed uh, the attitude of the Perm Zemstvo leaders to the political reforms uh, and uh, social, cultural, and political transformation uh, of the Russian Empire as a whole at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and our general conclusion is that uh, Zemstvo combines uh, the features of modern and traditional society, uh, but uh, in general, uh, its place uh, was in the tradition, traditional system uh, of government uh, of the late imperial Russia. Uh, and during the period of uh, Russian Revolution, uh, this system is rapidly changed. Uh, and uh, Zemstvo uh, was not ready for this. Uh, uh, this uh, turned out to be not adapted. Uh, and so we can tell about um, old institutions uh, in the uh, new system. Uh, the analysis shows that a study of elected uh, representative institutions, uh, including a Russian case, uh, is carried out with the framework of interdisciplinary approach. Uh, the result uh, of this research uh, is based on the integration of digital methods and tools. Uh, uh, and uh, we also can highlight two uh, large groups of digital methods. Uh, you can see it uh, on the slide. Uh, these are digital editions of historical sources and uh, persopographical systems and other databases. Uh, and uh, also we can talk about special optics uh, when working with such uh, digital sources and databases. Uh, we can look for large uh, social groups uh, and focus only on the individual uh, and its contribution to the history. Uh, and uh, thank you for your atten uh, attention. I'm sorry for these technical <laughs> problems. <laughs> Uh, my colleague uh, Ileana and I uh, are ready to answer your questions. Thank you very much for your presentation and also for being patient for all of the technical issues. Uh, so who would like to ask the first question? I can see some hands that are up. Um, Sally, you have your hand up, I can see. Yes, I, I was applauding, but uh, thank you very much. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but I can also an answer a question, um, ask a question even. Um, Anna, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, what would you say was the most challenging part of the project? I'm going to ask you a difficult question. What was the most challenging part of the project for you? And what would you have done differently if you could have learned from the experience that you had during the project to help other people who want to do similar projects? which I understand may be a difficult question, but it, it helps. Uh, I, al I always like to reflect on that uh, after projects.
Oh, please. Well, <laughs> sorry, it was too. Maybe oh. I was too mean. Sorry. No, but actually, this question of what is the most difficult and challenging aspect of any project or any research is really probably the most important thing that we can discuss. Like where where was the where was it difficult? What you know? What where were you hold? Where were you held up in your progress? Or was it a lack of data or was it a problem with the records or, uh, you know, all sorts of things could come in the way. That's a good question, I think. Mm. Uh, I think that the main difficulty was uh, in, uh, in problems of uh, comparing uh, maybe different, uh, different systems, uh, foreign and Russian, uh, mm -hmm. And uh, but, <laughs> um, uh, it was um, not experience, uh, and uh, some practices uh, were common, but uh, I think that uh, it is not easy, <laughs> and uh, it is not uh, something like uh, 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 we can't uh, just repeat it, uh, and uh, we should to uh, adapt uh, some methodics for our sources. I think that's an excellent answer and exactly, I mean, this is the importance of historical context and I know I, mine was in a library context, but we were mapping subject headings between different library systems and sometimes the concepts simply didn't exist in another culture. Um, so there are the, this is, this is the so, so important to do the context and then comparing it to other contexts which is different. And this is, this is one of the beauties of, of this kind of historical archival research. So great answer, Anna, thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Do we have another question? Um, anyone waiting to ask a question? Oh, can I also ask a question? Of course we can. Thank you. So thank you very much for this presentation. And I would like to ask you about the your work with the text. So have you analyzed only the exact meanings, exact words that you have shown, or have you also took into account, uh, taken into account some contexts, the contextual meanings? Uh -huh. Uh, we start with uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> we start with uh, just a content uh, analysis, uh, uh, frequency analysis. Uh, but uh, then, of course, uh, 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 no. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I think that um, uh, we start with. Um, Mm, uh, markers, uh, which uh, I think that uh, uh, which uh, uh, associated with traditionalism and modernity, and uh, then uh, the, the next step was uh, frequency analysis uh, and uh, some markers uh, uh, we uh, also find out uh, in uh, these results. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we work in these uh, contexts. Uh, Thank you so much. Maybe I can add, uh, we also uh, um work with uh, their persons, their members of uh, parliament, Russian parliament, Russian uh, local government. We study their biography and we l learn why this person say uh, any words uh, and why uh, they ask something about uh, self-local government or parliament. Thank you. Um, can I as well? Just a short yes. one. Yeah. Um, the last question. It's an uh, ongoing project. Uh, what's the next step of your uh, research in this field? Um, uh, <laughs> uh, we have uh, an idea of <laughs> the next project. <laughs> uh, 
uh, Ileana uh, Pennell, uh, I <laughs> tell you about. <laughs> Uh, mm, now, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, now we plan to study uh, the human capital uh, in Perm province uh, and uh, Zemstvo uh, and uh, uh, their role uh, uh, in, uh, <laughs> in forming uh, human capital uh, and uh, rule <laughs> human capital and so on. Good idea. Thanks. Good luck, girls. Thank you. Excellent. Um, okay, that, that was a, a very good discussion. And so now we move on to, according to my program, our final talk, if this is correct, um, on the topic of digital survey and information modeling application experience for the historical and cultural heritage objects. I welcome the presenters of our final talk for this session and this section. Oh, that's wonderful. So we can see the shared screen. Excellent. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um... I would like to present our topic, Digital Survey and Informational Modeling Applications Experience for the Historical and Cultural Heritage Objects. Uh, we represent architectural point of view on the cultural heritage. And our topic um, dedicated to, to the uh, architectural heritage and the digital survey in this field. Uh, Three-dimensional and special data are becoming today the key component for working with architectural data. And digital models can be a database for different types of that data about architectural and urban environment, from the current state uh, to the morphological interpretation and representation of, uh, of transformations over the time. Uh, in the field of the protection of objects of historical and cultural heritage, um, uh, digitalization uh, give us uh, new opportunities for um, and different scenarios for uh, obtaining uh, digital data from the reality uh, to the storage and management of huge amount of uh, knowledges about uh, architectural heritage. Uh, with the different uh, digital tools, such as laser scanning, photogrammetry, uh, we can obtain uh, digital information, uh, which uh, provide uh, uh, high accuracy and reduce uh, work time. And in this uh, report, we would like to summarize the experience of virtual reconstruction of cultural heritage objects uh, based uh, on data obtained using digital tools. I would like to present some, um, uh, some of our projects we work in this field. Um, First of all, I would like to say uh, that uh, the methods of building informational modeling and the uh, method of um, uh, representation in geoinformatic systems uh, give us opportunity to describe uh, real models uh, and real historical environment in different levels from the regional level till the level of a certain architectural object. Uh, first case study is uh, the house of Merkant uh, Baranova in Perm. Here we applied the methodology of classical laser scanning to obtain 
the digital drawings um, in AutoCAD. Uh, so we, we get uh, the point cloud uh, from the terrestrial laser scanner. And after that uh, process, the, this point cloud in uh, AutoCAD to, to get uh, the drawings. A more complex uh, model we, we have in the project of uh, historical uh, complex uh, in Usolia. Usolia is an old city on the north of Perm region, uh, and it, it have um, two parts, modern Usolia and historical part of this uh, city. Uh, uh, historical part, uh, uh, consist uh, there are there are a lot of historical buildings uh, are located on this uh, historical part of, of Usoli. and uh, it uh, as we can see on this photo it uh, in different conditions and uh, we also would like to um, in this project we wanted to represent every building of this territory and the relief of this territory and the first step was the field work. It was a terrestrial laser scanning uh, with obtaining of point clouds. And it was uh, uh, also portable laser scanning and um, uh, photogrammetry with aerial uh, photo, uh, with uh, photo shooting with drones. After uh, get this, uh, preliminary data. We reconstruct the objects in 3D shapes and uh, uh, get different buildings. Uh, the approaches to reconstruction of these buildings uh, depends, on, uh, uh, depends on different data we have. For example, for uh, some buildings we had uh, uh, we had documents with the results of architectural inspe uh, inspections and uh, architectural plans, so we uh, can reconstruct it more precisely uh, with these documents. And for some buildings, we use only point clouds uh, and um, field uh, and the results of field work. Uh, some buildings we have in reconstruction uh, with historical uh, historical um, appearance. And after that, every building we put on the terrain uh, and it um, uh, allows us to get the full model of the of this historical environment. And after that, it can um, it helped us to visualize all the manage all the um, all the solutions of our uh, strategic master plan um, and uh, visualize every solution and um, also use this model as a, as a visualization and also this model can be a database uh, about architectural objects uh, and uh, can help manage this territory because the main goal of this project was the help uh, of uh, the museum, um, Usoli Museum, uh, to manage this territory and develop and uh, find uh, the way to develop it. And also we use this model to get um, visualization as uh, visualization how it is in modern condition and how it could be in future, for example. And also to show how our solutions for the museum, uh, museum features can be um, in reality. And also we have some suggestions to use this model in VR and uh, use this model in uh, some virtual uh, excursions. 
Other our project is um, dedicated to architecture of upper Kama, and uh, it is a project uh, in, in collaboration with the University of Pavia and the University of Valencia. And uh, here we uh, trying to describe uh, architecture. Uh, mostly is it is the uh, churches and other religion objects of three uh, of the three territory Cherden, Solikamsk and Soli districts. Uh, here we have um, uh, approach of previous project uh, about visualization of our of uh, every building. And also we have catalogization system which can help us to save every uh, part of every information uh, about every building. Uh, we have a census card, um, which um, we full all the information about building, uh, which we, we have found from, from the ar archival data till the data we obtain with the field work. Uh, here we can see the example of a uh, list uh, of uh, Nikolska church in Nirop, for example. It is an architectural uh, description of this church, uh, one list of, of, from the census card. And here we uh, describe uh, the territory also on three levels using different pro uh, software. Uh, on the level of uh, ter territory, we use uh, ArcGIS and, uh, and uh, BIM combination. Um, for the description of every building, we use Archicad or Revit. And for the description, every element of the building, we use Revit. Um, and also we uh, combine uh, different types of point clouds to obtain uh, accurate models uh, about um, this architecture. Uh, and these uh, models, uh, not only models for visualization, but also models uh, like a database. Uh, it, uh, it is a building informational models, which uh, consists from the elements. Um, every element have uh, information about material, uh, geometry, and so on. And the last uh, for this presentation, last project I would like to, to describe. It is a project uh, about, uh, for the Solikamsk Museum. Uh, this project we make in collaboration with Solikamsk Museum. And uh, the idea of this project is visualization of central part of Solikamsk to uh, to get the model for um, tourists we have uh, six uh, five churches and uh, one uh, one uh, vodavoda house uh, in this part of the city the list uh, of the objects you can see on the slide uh, and uh, we reconstruct this, uh, these buildings in two, uh, in two times, modern condition and architectural condition. We also use here the uh, technology of photogrammetry and laser scanning. Uh, also, we use the photo fixation and the aerial photo photography uh, with different drones. Uh, and the um, model consists from three uh, parts. It is a model of environment, model of architectural monuments, and mod models of other buildings. And three of these components combined, combined in one big model for two conditions. 
for the condition of modern uh, environment and for the historical uh, appearance of this um, of this part of the city. And the steps uh, we use is um, laser scanning point cloud, obtaining and registry, uh, merging point clouds with photogrammetric data. After that, we importing to Archicad and create 3D models of every building. After that, we combine in uh, every building with environment in uh, 3D Max, and after that we import to Lumion for visualization, and after that we import to Unity for project presentation on a website. Um, here we can see the historical view of uh, Troitsky uh, Cathedral. Uh, this is the representation of historic view. And here we can see the reconstruction of the modern uh, condition of this uh, cathedral. And after that, we put it every, uh, we model it every, uh, every church um, in uh, different files. And after that, put it together to obtain a common model for modern condition and for a historical view. And after that, the, uh, the result, uh, it uh, have to be the website uh, where tourists can uh, see the model and see the historical appearance of the churches. So as a conclusion, I would like to say that uh, a lot of advantages of uh, give gives us uh, digital technology, and uh, such models can be used uh, not only for architectural, uh, not applied only for architectural uh, needs, uh, but also used for the museum needs and uh, for uh, VR reconstruction of uh, of the environment and also 3D printing and uh, other managing uh, for uh, be a platform for uh, other manage management solutions. So thank you for your attention. My report is finished. I would like to say uh, to ask the questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'm sure that there will be a number of questions and we've got some time uh, to have a number of questions. So anybody who would like to put up their hand. Oh, Sally, you're, are you putting up your hand to I, ask I'm really questions? putting up my hand. This I clapped already, so yes, thank you. Okay. Anastasia, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, it's, it's well, there's a one question and maybe a couple of comments. Um, the, the, the question, so you could think about that and then I'll share, share the comments is, this is all very technical data sets. You've got lots of different types of data. Um, and I just wondered to what extent you've considered preservation uh, of this data. Um, so you talked about the catalog, uh, the cataloging system that you use to record this data, but I just wondered where you archive and even preserve for the long term the data that you collect in these projects. Mm. Uh, yes, for um, yes, it's a huge amount of uh, gigabytes of those data, and uh, we we use cloud uh, clouds uh, for uh, for pres for preserve all the data. Um, and is that cloud a commercial cloud, or do you, do do you have a copy of that on the university? servers or somewhere in case this 
Com if well, do you use a, a university cloud or is it a commercial cloud? Um, and mm. if so, do you have a co either a local copy or um, it's on your university server somewhere? It's a pity that we don't have uh, the university, the place in the university uh, hardware and uh, so on. So we use uh, our uh, clouds, uh, commercial clouds, and so on um, for storage. Well, that's that's really. But uh, it could be nice if uh, the, there is some academic uh, big cloud, uh, <laughs> if, if I could say that, uh, where we can storage everything. And uh, because the um, point cloud database is really uh, sometimes it's really huge and a lot of uh, data and photos. This is well. a very interesting idea to see whether there are clouds, academic clouds out there that could mm -hmm. provide access to the different universities who don't have the access yet. Mm -hmm. So that's a, I will take this back into to project meetings because that's a very interesting idea. And then just to put into the chat, um, I don't know if you know the DARIA group, that is the Digital Research Infrastructure for the Arts and Humanities. Um, I'm not sure it's exactly the same work you're doing, but they have a working group on digital practices for the study of urban heritage. Um, and I know that you talked about the possibility of doing virtual reality and tourism and that sort of thing. It, it may be worth uh, having a look to see they're really great guys that do that so um i'm sure if you drop them an email they could be interesting if it is the same and now i've lost the other link i don't know in our university there is a group that does something called if i've understand rightly is it re-photography -photogra re which it's not my area i'm a librarian but um where you've got like Google Maps, but for historical periods and you take archival photographs and put them, geolocate them. And I, this is, a, a, is an article that one of my colleagues has recently written about facades of buildings where you kind of copy and paste <laughs> onto Google Maps um, or Google Street View rather. Um, ancient photographs and I just wanted to share that in case it's interesting for what you're you talked about archival photographs too so um, just in case it's interesting I think this isn't an open access copy but if you're interested um, I'm sure we could get the preprint for you as well um, from my colleagues so that wouldn't be a problem. Thank you very much I will uh, see the links and uh, read everything. We've just got maybe maybe one more question because I'm, I'm conscious that the next session is going to start soon so we we need to finish off our session um are there any other questions I, i'm looking in the chat now the couple of chats uh, oh they're just information um so would anybody like to ask another question or should we just finish up now i mean we've had a pretty good session i've been very pleased to be able to chair this session we had a couple of technical glitches but fantastic present presenters and many participants so thank you all you're clapping now sally that's good i can see that yeah oh. well, okay let's bring this session to a close and thanks to everyone who participated in it and um, we can look forward to the next session thank you so much